Hello everyone and welcome to this, our online presbytery service. So although we, although we might lament the fact that we can't physically meet, we are glad that we can meet together here online. Wherever you are and across the, the presbytery of Dublin and Munster, or even if you're listening in from outside the presbytery, I want to say a huge big welcome. And we want to, we want to pray that the Lord will bless us all as we worship him together today. Right at the start, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to be not just an observer. I want you to be a worshiper. I want us all to be worshipers today. That we'll sing these songs together in our own homes or wherever we happen to be. That we'll join in with the prayers and add a, add a hearty amen at the end. And as the scriptures are read and as, as, uh, as we listen to our sermon today, make sure that you have your Bible open in front of you. So make sure that you use this opportunity to worship the Lord. There's going to be that temptation, I guess, to just sit back and, and watch out for the people that you recognize. But instead, make sure you use this chance to worship God. And to encourage us to do that, I want to share a call to worship today. I want to read some verses from Psalm 95. This is Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2 and 6 and 7. The psalmist writes, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. So let's, let's worship the Lord together today. Let's do that now.
Let's pray. Loving God, this is the day that you have made and we thank you for it. We thank you for all the good things which surround us, our homes, our families, our friends, our churches, the vastness of the universe, the beauty of the natural world, the sights and sounds of daily life. We thank you for all the interest and opportunities and pleasures this day will bring. We thank you for the love of Christ encircling us, his spirit guiding us and your eternal purpose constantly inspiring us. We thank you for this day set aside so that we might praise you together with your people, so that we might bring our lives before you and consecrate every day to your service. Loving God, we bring you our praise. Gladly and reverently, we offer our worship. We declare your greatness. We acknowledge your faithfulness. We rejoice in your goodness and marvel at your holiness. All we have and all that is we owe to you. You are ever at work in our lives and our world, striving to help and strengthen, heal and comfort, forgive and restore, undo wrongs and establish right. For all that you have given, we praise and worship you. Loving God, forgive us that we have sometimes lost sight of your great love, that we've been forgetful of you, greeting some days with indifference, even reluctance, instead of wel welcoming them as a gift. We have failed to count our blessings or appreciate how fortunate we really are. We have even made this time of worship a duty or tradition rather than a privilege. Loving God, we know we have failed you in much. We have not given you due recognition. We have not shown thanksgiving in our hearts. We have not always lived as your people. So have mercy on us. Cleanse us from all our weaknesses pardon our sins, renew our faith, and restore us to your side. And so with your help, through the grace of Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, may we be enabled to live more faithfully as your servants, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Today, we're going to be reading a story from the Bible about Jesus and how he showed the love we were just singing about to some people who were afraid. Have you ever been afraid? I know I have. Now, the stories about Jesus' life here on earth can be found in the Gospels, which are the first four books of the New Testament. Can you name them? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Today's story can be found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, Jesus had been speaking to a crowd of people, but when evening came, he said to his close friends, the disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got in a boat and they set out as they sailed, Jesus fell asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat. Suddenly, a furious storm swept over the lake, and the waves grew so high that they crashed over the sides of the boat. They were in great danger, and the disciples were very afraid. But Jesus remained fast asleep. The disciples woke him up and yelled over the howling winds and crashing waves. Teacher, we're going to die. Don't you care? Save us. And Jesus said, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? He got up and said to the wind and the waves, Quiet, be still. And immediately, the wind died down, and it was completely calm. The disciples were amazed and terrified, and they asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. That's a really good question. Who is Jesus? Why do the wind and waves do exactly what he says? 
Well, Jesus is God, the one who created the wind and the waves. That's why he can tell them what to do. But in the midst of this storm, the disciples forgot to have faith. They forgot who Jesus is and forgot to trust him. If they had remembered that Jesus is God, they would have known he was in complete control over everything happening to them. But since he was asleep, they believed they were going to die. They did not believe that he was still watching over them. Now this was a very scary storm, and our world is also full of great dangers and things that are scary and terrifying. The disciples had good reason to be afraid, and often so do we. So, if you're ever afraid, remember that you can always ask Jesus for help. No matter what happens in our lives, God is always going to be right here with us, just as Jesus was in the boat with his disciples. He never leaves us or forgets us. He knows everything that goes on in our lives, and he is in control. So let's ask Jesus for help. Pray after me. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for being with us all the time, especially when we are afraid. Help us remember that you love us and you are always in complete control. Amen.
Now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, the Reverend John Woodside, a former member of our presbytery. We're very grateful to John for, for being our speaker today. His title or his theme is uh, Practicing Faith in Times of Isolation. And he's going to be speaking from two scripture passages. That's Psalm 139 and Philippians chapter 4. And those are going to be read for us just now. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 14. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me. Even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you have created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. This is God's word. God bless you all from everyone in Ahada and Trinity Cork. Reading from the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 to 9. The title of these words, Exhortations. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. It's a great privilege to share in the service with you this morning. And before we come to God's word, let's take a moment to pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. For your great name's sake. Amen. Let me draw your attention to a single verse in the Bible from Psalm 115 and verse 2. Why do the nations say, where is their God? As I think of it scattered all over the presbytery this morning, and indeed all over this island, I suspect that there's one thing that we all share in common, the feeling of isolation. Even before COVID, many Christians felt somewhat spiritually isolated in a society where more and more people want to run their affairs without reference to God, a so-called secular society. And thanks to COVID now, we're also separated physically from family, from friends, from grandchildren, and from normal social life. And now in these last few weeks, even from Sunday worship together in church. We miss it, meeting friends, sharing in the means of grace, the singing of the great hymns, and that special sense of God's presence that Jesus promised, where two or three gather in my name, there I will be in the midst. But right now, that's a privilege we don't have. 
So I suppose we can sympathise with the psalmist in Psalm 115. Exiled in Babylon, surrounded by pagan shrines, far from the temple which he associated with God's presence. Wondering why, when pagan forces ransacked the city of God, that God seemed to do nothing about it. And now his neighbours are asking, where is their God? Because they had gods of gold and silver they could see and touch. Was the psalmist God languishing somewhere in a temple a thousand kilometres away in Jerusalem? Now, the psalmist's answer is quite emphatic. Absolutely not. Verse 3, he says, Our God is in heaven, and he does what he ordains. In other words, the psalmist's communion with God was in no way limited to a building or a time or a place. And that poses the question for us this morning. If we can't go to church at present, where can we meet with God? Let me suggest no less than six means of grace commended in the Bible and accessible to each one of us during this lockdown. The first one is to recognise God's nearness where we are. Psalm 139. The psalmist reminds us that there is no such thing as a secular space, no place where God is absent. He tells how he tried by every means to escape God's presence. But he had to admit defeat. He writes, where can I escape your spirit? You hem me in from behind and before. The popular myth is that we human beings are seeking for God. We can't find him. And so we assume that he's not there. But the reality is that we are rebel creatures on the run from God, trying to keep him at bay while his presence is pressing in on every side. So whether we head to the hills or hide in the crowd in the centre of the city, he's there. And that's why Paul could tell the philosophers in Athens, he's not far from any one of us. And indeed, that was the great comfort for St. Patrick as he faced the threats of the Druids as he preached the gospel. Christ beside me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ on my right hand. Christ on my left hand. So wherever you are this morning, he's right there beside you. Now the second means of grace is to delight in God's works of creation. Psalm 29. The choir in my home church, when I was a child, used to sing an anthem, worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. And I used to take that to mean a beautiful church building with stained glass windows. Then I discovered that the words come from Psalm 29 and the context has nothing to do with being in church but an approaching thunderstorm unleashing its tremendous power over a forest. Bolts of lightning bringing down great uh, cedars of Lebanon, great oak trees stripping them of their bark and so evident is the power and the majesty of God on display that the psalmist tells us in verse 9 that the whole temple And by that he means the whole of nature cries out, glory, glory, glory. I have a little grandson who's just got two words. Haya is what he greets everybody with. And then there's another word he uses when he sees an insect in a flower head or feels the texture of the bark of a tree or watches a little robin skipping from branch to branch in front of him. He says, wow, wow, wow. And John Calvin tells us that the whole of nature is a theatre of God's glory. Wherever we look, whether it's the first snowdrops, the starlit sky, the crashing of the waves, the scent of roses, or the breaching of a great whale on the Wexford coast, all of these are designed to cause us to look upwards and say, wow, wow. Or to put it in the words of this psalm, give to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. The third means of grace is to set aside time for daily devotion. God gives us an amazing invitation in Psalm 27. He says, seek my face. And our Lord Jesus Christ did just that when he drew aside to a quiet place daily and communed with his Father and he instructed his disciples to do the same. And the Apostle James assures us, if you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. 
And I suppose for most of us, that means the age-old practice of reading our Bibles when God speaks to us and saying our prayers when we speak back to him. And perhaps for some of us, if that's not been our practice, this is an opportunity to perhaps take a gospel or some part of the Bible and during this period say, I'm going to read a little bit every day, just a small section, not rush through it, read it, think about it, meditate, see what God is maybe going to say to me. And then to turn that into prayer as I speak back to him. And perhaps what may begin for us as a discipline or a duty may end up becoming a delight. For Psalm 19 reminds us that the law of the Lord enlightens the mind and refreshes the soul and rejoices the heart and will become sweeter than honeycomb to the soul. The fourth discipline is to do everything for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31. What the mystics call the sacrament of living. Because we have inherited a mindset in this country which distinguishes between sacred and secular duties. It gives the impression that God is most pleased with us when we're at church or singing hymns or praying. As distinct from the rest of our life at work or at play or with our families. But is it not significant that after 30 years of living as a carpenter in a local village, having preached no sermon and worked no miracles, it was then that God the Father looked down on the Son and said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Because Jesus lived an undivided life. He did everything for God's glory. So whether we're driving a tractor or serving uh, in the ward or serving customers in a shop or doing up the books or plowing a field in the factory or in an office. Paul says, eating or drinking. Do everything to God's glory. And then fifthly, the Bible calls us to maintain a spirit of thankfulness. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, give thanks in all circumstances. It can be so easy to moan about the things we don't have rather than to be thankful for the things that we do have. Just over a week ago, I received a letter from someone who's a member of one of our churches in, in the Dublin and Munster Presbytery. This letter was written over 10 days because the lady has Parkinson, she walks in crutches, she suffers from osteoporosis, she has two metal knees and a metal hip which help ease the pain she's had for years. And this is what she writes. I'm so grateful to God to be so well. Lockdown is not as bad as lockup. The very word reminds me of that terrible little room in the locked ward in a psychiatric hospital. No handle on the inside of the door and a shutter over the window. For I was a suicide risk. Thank God that those days have gone, though I can't avoid the memories. And then she goes on to recall how on Palm Sunday 23 years ago, through a caring friend, she was invited to church to hear a choir, and she writes, During that service, something happened to me. God spoke to me. I realized for the first time that a very special somebody loved me. I didn't have to be afraid anymore. Heaven began for me then. I began to walk along his path, and everything changed. I became a new person. The body is wearing out, but the spirit is young again. I have pain, but I have never been so happy, for I can talk to him any time without having to make an appointment. So I don't waste time thinking about the things I cannot do. I am so happy to enjoy what I can do. Life is wonderful. A spirit of thankfulness. And finally, we're told to remember that God is sovereign in all things, even in a COVID pandemic. Back to Psalm 115, what did the psalmist say? Our God is in heaven and he does what he ordains. Israel's exile in Babylon was no surprise to God, for indeed he ordained it and he told Isaiah in advance that it was going to happen and also that the people would return to their home, which they did. God was working out his purposes for good, even in exile, and he still is during this pandemic. Let me give you just one example. 
Here's a young teacher who was assigned on teaching practice to a school where a former teacher was the vice principal, a man who he found difficult to work with. The older man was cynical and critical of his young colleague's Christian faith and didn't mind letting him know. He gave him a hard time. But in due course, the young teacher was called into full-time Christian ministry and just over a year ago took up his first charge. And COVID intervened, forcing him to conduct his services online. Just a couple of months ago, he received a call from his former vice principal. When I heard you'd become a minister, he wrote, I decided to listen to one of your services. I've been tuned in ever since. I've come to see that you were right and I was wrong. And I want to let you know I've just committed my life to Christ. We never know what God is up to, what blessings will flow from these difficult days. But just a final word. During this year, some of us have lost friends and loved ones. And they remind us that even when we return to going to church and this whole thing is over, we will still be isolated. For as the Bible reminds us, here we have no continuing city, but we seek that which is to come. We still are pilgrims and strangers. And the ultimate comfort this morning is to know for certain that we are on that road home to that city. And that is possible, not because of anything we have done or any merit that we have achieved, but because God's Son left home and he faced the ultimate isolation on the cross so that he could blaze open a trail, a way home to God for us to follow. And he says to us, follow me. If some of us this morning find ourselves like the psalmist in Psalm 139, still in the run from God, we could learn from how that psalm ends. Note how the psalm, psalmist says he comes to his senses. He stopped running from God and he turned to God. And he prayed, he said, Lord, I've got it wrong. Please lead me in the way everlasting. And that's where the journey can begin for each of us. Dundrum Shopping Centre in Dublin has been described as a secular cathedral. Some years ago, as hundreds of shoppers were going about their business, they were stopped in their tracks by the sound of 400 voices bursting into magnificent song, using the words from the last book of the Bible, what we call the Hallelujah Chorus. The Lord God omnipotent reigns, King of kings and Lord of lords, forever and forever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. A so-called secular space filled with the music of heaven, pointing to that day when there will be no more isolation or separation, when the church on earth and the church in heaven will be one, when Christ has reconciled all things in heaven and on earth to himself, when we shall see him and we shall be like him, and when we shall renew fellowship with those who have gone before, and when God's whole creation will be filled with the glory of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. But we're not there yet, and tomorrow is Monday. So let's remember that while we're still in lockdown, to recognize God's nearness, to delight in God's works, to seek God's face daily, to do everything to God's glory, to be constantly thankful, and to rejoice that he is sovereign, even in days of COVID. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, even in these days when we cannot meet together to worship you, help us to see you more clearly, to walk with you more nearly, and to love you more dearly. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for your word, for every word in Holy Scripture and for Christ whom they proclaim. And Father, we pray that today on this Lord's Day, your word would be proclaimed all around the world. And we pray especially for those places around the world where there is very little training and very few 
resources to help your people rightly handle the word of truth. Uh, oh Lord, bless the work of Langham Partnership as they seek to train and equip. Uh, we think too of Wycliffe Bible Translators. We pray that you would prosper their work. Father, where there is persecution, may your word bring joy and perseverance to your children. Uh, where there is false teaching, we pray that your word would correct and reform. And we pray, Lord, that that you will build your church and that the knowledge of the glory of God would, would fill the earth, even as the waters cover the sea. Nations are formed from the immutable and the malleable. You challenge us with contrast and contradiction, God of the inside out and back to front. Give us the vision to seek them and to see in them your covenant story which began in an ending. Held in that story is our prayer for all who live on this island, where nationhood has too often been built on what seemed immutable, rather than the threads of our connectedness, trembling, light as gossamer, yet holding fast, and holding still through pandemic griefs. Held in that story is our prayer that our nationhood builds impossible new beginnings from what looked like dead ends. Held by your love, your persistence, until your kingdom comes. Dear Lord, we pray for all our Christian families and congregations across this island at this time. We thank you that through the wonders of technology, We've been able to meet virtually and share prayers and worship from our homes. We pray that again we will soon be able to meet together in person. Thank you for all those who have worked throughout these unusual times to bring us church services and other activities, such as youth group meetings, Sunday school meetings and Bible studies. Guide and direct us as a church family, so we strive to look after one another and do what we can, as the restrictions allow, to help our wider community. We pray for other Christian groups who are continuing to bring the message across our country at this time. Amen. That brings us to the very end of our online presbytery service. I hope it was a blessing or, a, or an encouragement or a challenge, whatever the Lord wanted to do in your life. I want to say thank you for everybody who's been online to, to, uh, to take part in the service. I want to say thank you to all of all of the congregations who contributed the, the material that, that made up the service. And I want to say a big, big, big thank you to Richard and to Ryan who put it all together and planned it all. So thanks to every one of you. And just now, I want to conclude with some words of benediction. This is uh, the familiar words of the ironic blessing in Numbers chapter 6. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. That's our prayer for one another, that we would know the Lord's blessing, the Lord's grace and the Lord's peace, and all of it available only in Christ Jesus. Amen. No.